This is a production from the Takedown Sports. What's up, y'all? T Brown 31 here with J Bot the Great. And this is our reaction and review of game four of the NBA Finals. So, after the Suns went up 2 0 in game two on Thursday, the Bucks came back in game three to bring the series to 2 to 1 going into game four. So, in game four, Milwaukee ended up winning with a score of 109 to 103, led by Chris Middleton with 40 points. Giannis also nearly had a triple-double with 26, 14, and 8. On the other side, Devin Booker led the Suns with 42 points. So, just like last week, what are your reactions as a Bucks fan to this game? Well, unlike last week, I'm happy with the outcome of this game, uh, as well as the Game 3 outcome. <laughs> yeah. It's good to bring the series back to 2-2. It gives us more of a, of a chance. It's the same thing that happened in uh, Brooklyn, actually. We went down 2-0. We came back tied at 2-2. So we'll see how this goes from here. Um, there's a lot to be happy about as a Bucks fan with this game, uh, just the way we rebounded. Uh, Pat Connaughton, the little guy, going out and, and rebounding and, and getting nine rebounds in the you know amount of time he played. 31 minutes is a long time, but still, nine rebounds for his height is, is pretty impressive. Um, Chris putting up 46 for with two steals. It's also pretty, pretty great. You can be happy about that. Giannis, almost with that triple-double, like you said, that's... That's something to be happy about, and obviously coming out with the win is, is a great thing. Um, both teams definitely had the the refs to complain about. Uh, this was one of the worst officiated games I've seen both ways, and I think the the Bucks just battled out and got the got the better at the end. Uh, we could be happy with how we forced Chris Paul into having five turnovers. That is very unlike Chris Paul, and uh, yeah, I mean a lot of good things that the Bucks did last night. Obviously, they came out with a win, so you have to do something good. Uh, but the issue is, is there's a lot of things that you can not even be like, well, this could have been a little better. It's just, it has to be better. We can't win a series with these things happening this consistently. And that is Drew Holiday shot four for 20, opening up 0 for 5. It may have been worse than that, but I know for sure 0 for 5. Uh, Brooke Lopez, 4 for 9, 14 points, not that bad. PJ Tucker played 29 minutes, put up zero points, five rebounds, an assist, a steal, took one shot and missed it and got five fouls. I know he's like a defensive, you know, floor general, but you can't be fouling five times and not contributing anything other than five rebounds. And don't get me wrong, five rebounds is great. P.J. Tucker is not exactly a big guy either, so getting five rebounds is impressive, but he's got to do more. He's, he's a starter. Uh, obviously, only played 29 minutes. You know, he got uh, two less minutes than Pat Connaughton. He got a lot more minutes than Brooke Lopez, though. And uh, it's just, you don't want to see a starter come out and do that. Bobby Portis, who's usually great off the bench, came in, hit a three, and uh, also grabbed five rebounds and then decided he was out. He did hit a pretty clutch block in the fourth quarter that, that started kind of the defensive eating of Phoenix at, at, towards the end of the game. So you, you got to credit that. Uh, I think Trey Young said it during the Hawks series. He was like, it doesn't matter uh, how many shots you make is when you make them. That can apply to things like blocks and steals as well. It's not... You don't have to put up eight blocks to have a great game. You can, I mean, you can get the, a game ceiling block. And I would say that Portis's block wasn't a game ceiling one, but it kicked off uh, a hungrier defense by the by the Bucks. Giannis, though, had what I would consider a game ceiling block. May not have guaranteed the win, and it may not also not have been needed. There, there's no telling, but it was definitely a, a, a pace changer. And I mean, a great play. He essentially guarded Devin Booker and DeAndre Aiden, and and at the same time not not easy to do and you know came up with the with the big block so a lot to complain about but there's a lot to be happy about uh chris middleton putting up 40 is always a great thing you know he's we, we say on this show he's consistently inconsistent uh <laughs> we got the the great part of chris middleton and hopefully he stays like that there are there is an interesting stat and it's like chris averages like 30 from games four to seven this series but like way less in games one to three so you know maybe uh, Chris is, has awoken for the, the rest of the series, but we have to have Drew Holiday uh, come up as well. Don't don't get me wrong. Seven rebounds, seven assists, that's great. But you're supposed to be the third, you know, offensive option. 
and not just for assisting. And putting up 13 isn't bad in, in, in certain circumstances, but shooting four for 20 is unacceptable from a guy like uh, Drew Holiday. And these aren't like he's missing, uh, you know, strongly contested threes. These are a lot of these misses come from him trying to put back the ball right at the rim and just, I don't know how, but completely missing it. It was just sad to see. So I'm definitely happy. I'm glad it's 2 2. I hope he can go to Phoenix and, and keep the intensity of the fourth quarter, keep Chris hot, keep uh, Giannis doing what he's doing. But we got to have Drew Holiday become, you know, the Drew Holiday we traded for. Yeah, so there's a whole lot to unpack about this game. So that's why we specifically made a video just for game four, because it was probably the most exciting of the series so far, for sure. But uh, to start, I guess I'll start with Chris Middleton. Um, obviously, he had an amazing game. This is the type of game that you would want from Chris, being your number two, being, you know, a guy that's supposed to be a consistent all-star for the past few years and going forward. Him putting up 40 points as well as six rebounds, four assists. Exactly what you want from him. Obviously, he's not going to be scoring 40 every single game. But, you know, if you can get 26 to 40 from him, or at least like 25, something like that, then you should be good. However, this idea that Chris Middleton is somehow the Batman and Giannis is the Robin in this situation is insanely confusing to me. And I think this is where basketball coverage kind of gets to be a little you know, annoying and bad overall because they let narratives get in the way of what's actually happening here. Obviously, Chris Milton scoring 40 points. He led the team was a big deal, but they act like Giannis only scored five points or something. The man still put in 26 points, 14 rebounds, almost had a triple-double, as I said earlier. They, it's just the fact that they're acting like Giannis barely did anything. Chris Milton did everything himself. Chris Milton is supposed to show up. And this is the problem with media coverage of Giannis. Giannis, like I said last week, will generally put up 30 points a game. Other than that first game when he came back from injury, he's generally going to put up 30 points somewhere around 26 to 40, you know, on any given night. And some people are acting like it's his fault that they lose. Like, no, generally when they lose, Giannis puts up 35 points and Chris Middleton or Drew Holiday or both, they don't show up. Obviously, Chris Middleton shows up last night in the game. So they win because Giannis also does what he generally does. There's no reason to sit here and act like Giannis isn't a number one guy. He can't be a number one guy on a championship team. He's not a superstar. He's not a playoff performer. That's nonsense. If Giannis wasn't on the team, they wouldn't be here. They wouldn't even be close to the finals. And the man won two MVPs. It hasn't been that long since he won the MVPs. It was just the season before this past one, obviously. I don't know why everyone's, you know, getting on his case. Um, the main thing that I would get on his case about is obviously the fact he doesn't really have a jumper still. And the free throws are, they seem to get a little bit better um, in, in a vacuum at least. But those are not huge criticism of his game because he can still score 30 points and the other team cannot stop him unless they build some kind of a wall. So... We need to stop this idea that he is the number two here or something like that. I, I just don't, I, I'm not even a Bucks fan like you are, but we have to start giving this guy credit. We can't sit here and act like he's not allowed to have teammates show up. He's like, that's what, what do you, what do you else need you teammates for? Like if you don't need teammates to show up, then he'd be playing one on five, which he essentially does every other game. So you can give Chris Middleton props without sitting here saying Giannis is a Robin and all kinds of nonsense like that. And I know a lot of it's just talking heads in sports media, but <laughs> I see people that are supposed to be big basketball fans parroting the same nonsense. And it's just a little ridiculous. But with that being said, this is what you need from Chris Middleton. Um, so if he can come in, like I said, get 20 to 40 points a game, and we'll get to Drew Holiday in a second. But if he can come in and do that and Giannis will score his 30 every game, his 10 rebounds or so, his five assists or so, you know, they should be good going out. You know, if you have a poor game from Chris Paul like you did, but uh, I'll get into that, throwing it back to you. Yeah, so I just want to kind of talk about what you said with the media coverage and stuff, because I think you make some great points. Um, Giannis is definitely not the most disrespected superstar, but I've noticed that he's one of the few superstars that people cannot praise without bashing. Like, they're like, 
yeah, well, Giannis was a two-time MVP. He averages like 30, but he can't shoot. Or Giannis says this, this, and this, but he can't do this. And he, he has to have Chris or he has to have Drew. And give the band his flowers. Like And like Terrence said, uh, Giannis is the Batman here or whatever you want to call it. Um, <laughs> without Giannis, uh, as a Bucks fan, we either aren't in the playoffs uh, or, or we ain't in the finals, that's for sure. Uh, eighth seed, seventh seed, maybe. But, you know. We would have been like that. We'd have been out first round to the to Brooklyn for sure. It took us seven to get through Brooklyn with Giannis. Uh, so imagine if we didn't have Giannis, not happening. So Giannis is the main the main guy for sure. And uh, I think Chris deserves praise for dropping forty for sure. But you know he'll have games where he scores twenty six, just like Giannis did last night. And people are like, amazing, Chris is alive. And it's like, I mean, yeah, sure, it's great points, but that's what Chris should be doing. Like he doesn't need a special praise because he hit. What, it, what Giannis's average is. Like, I, that's what we need. We need him to hit that, you know, constantly. And uh, I don't know. It, it's just, it seems like Giannis can't can't win for, for losing. <laughs> as soon as he does something great, you know, the media comes with, like, kind of backhanded praise. And as soon as one of his teammates shows up, then the media is like, ah, yes, this is the Jesus of the Bucks, and, and Giannis is, is nothing. He, he doesn't exist. And he... Uh, Without him last night and his near triple double, all parts of it—the rebounds, the the assist, and definitely the points—we don't win that game. And especially if you take Giannis out and have Drew and and Brooke and Bobby and everyone play how they played last night, we don't win that game even close. It's, it's nowhere near a win. So you got people got to respect Giannis. People got to realize that Chris is the the sidekick. Now is Chris more clutch than Giannis? Sure, because Chris can shoot. And so if they clog the paint, you can get it to Chris somewhere that's not right at the front, and he can he can score. So I'll give it that Chris is more clutch. But being the more clutch player on a team doesn't make you the Batman. It makes you the more the closer, the, the more clutch player, right? Giannis can put up 50, but if he needs Chris to just score two at the very end on a, on a game-winning shot, does that make Chris Batman because he, he had a game-winner and finished with two points? No. So it's, you got to look at it that way. So you can be the, the more clutch, the more closing player. But that doesn't make you the more dominant. That doesn't make you the main star. Uh, and it, it just, it doesn't also open up the door for you to disrespect who the main star is. Yeah, and just to finish this point, every single team in NBA history has either had some kind of super team, um, whether it be a big three, you know, a big four, big two, whatever the heck you want to call it, or they've had a really good MVP caliber player and a very solid team behind them. But either way, you have to have more than just one person show up to win a basketball game. And I don't know why Giannis is one of the few people that gets, you know, a bunch of criticism for having these co-stars show up and actually contribute the way they should be doing. That's what they get paid big money to do. So I don't know why he gets criticism for that. It might be the fact that he isn't from here. Um, I think a lot of times us as fans just in general don't want to give foreign players credit. Um, and some of the best foreign players in our league, or excuse me, excuse me, some of the best players in our league are foreign players. Obviously, Jokic just won MVP. Luka is probably going to win an MVP at some point in time. Uh, Joel Embiid was an MVP candidate, and Giannis has won the past two before Jokic. So, I mean, these guys are showing how good they are right before our eyes, and we seem to be so fast to criticize them for simple things. Now, obviously, other guys that are American-born also get criticism as well, but it's just a theory. Uh, it's not fact or anything. I mean, if Giannis was from the U.S., maybe he would get the same criticism. But I think the fact that he's not a U.S. citizen, well, he's not from the U.S. at least, might play a little bit into it. Um, or the fact that he's not really in the NBA fraternity, so to speak. Um, even though he gives all the other guys respect. Now, besides that, Drew Holiday I don't know what the heck happened to him last night. I mean, that was just probably one of the worst performances I've seen from a starting uh, all-star caliber player in the finals. I mean, it was just bad, bad, bad. Now, he did put in seven rebounds and seven assists, like you said, and he finished with 13, which, as you said, also wouldn't be horrible. But considering the circumstances, he shot four for 20. He did start over five, at least, like you said. And the defense that he plays does not make up for the fact that he shot so horribly. All right. Like he did clamp Chris Paul and he has been playing well on Chris Paul the entire series so far. So I have to give him credit there. But 
the fact that he shot four for 20 is just absolutely unacceptable. You cannot shoot 20% in a game. I mean, that just doesn't make sense. And again, he isn't shooting, you know, these crazy threes, fadeaway threes from half court or anything like that with two people on him. A lot of them are just easy putbacks that he just can't get in. And I don't know if it's like a confidence thing or what. And I, obviously you can't force the ball to go in a basket. Everybody would try to score on every single shot. But four for 20, something's clearly wrong there. And they might have gotten away with him having such a bad performance in that game just because Chris had 20, excuse me, 40 and Giannis had 26. But he has to do better than that. I mean, there's really no excuse. Like I said, your defense does not excuse you shooting that horribly in a game. So through Holiday, whatever he has to do, he needs to do it. Figure out how to shoot better going forward. At least get 30%, man. Like 20%. And the fact that he kept shooting, too. I mean, you, you missed that many shots to start the game. I understand trying to get your confidence back. But then you continuously miss shots? Like this man made one in five shots, bro. <laughs> it's, this is... um. Going back a, a few games, it might have been this regular season. I, there was a game where either Chris or Drew or somebody wasn't shooting well. And in one of the post-game conferences, uh, Giannis was like, you know, we tell them if they're not hitting their rhythm, just keep shooting until you get it. And that's a great regular season mentality. That's a great first-round mentality when you're the number one seed. That is not a great finals mentality. Because if you go in there and you shoot and you miss your first five shots and you go, nah, I got it. I got my rhythm now. <laughs> and then you miss your next five shots. And your team ends up losing by like two or three. It can be easily attributed to the fact that you missed 20 shots. You only missed 16. I, I'm exaggerating. But, you know, this is not the time to decide, well, just don't worry about it. I'm going to get my rhythm in a few. Especially when you're missing those putbacks. If I know he's a little guy <laughs> he, at 6'3". He's, he's, I think, one of the smaller people on the court. Um, so when he goes for these putbacks, I, I get it that it's not his like his size and everything to dunk. But he can dunk. And it might be better for him to just try to dunk when he goes for the putback instead of trying to tip it. Because every ball he's tipped in these playoffs, at least these finals, I don't think he's made one yet uh, as far as the tip-ins go. And he's right there. He's always in prime position to hop up and hit the missed shot. And then he tips it, and he tips it into you know uh, a defending uh, player, and then the Suns go back and they reset the offense, and you've got a tough situation. So it'd really be easy if he would just jump up put some force on it and dunk it at least every now and then. But it does that's going to be the, the key. Uh, he's got to stop. He's got to realize this is the final. He can't just, you know, open up like a, mach a machine gun and just spray and pray. Uh, and he's got to actually put some of these putbacks in, you know, uh, make the putback what it's, what it's called and not just a, a here you go, you know, you know fancy rebound for, for one of the other players because it, it's just, it's really sad to watch uh, a player of Drew Holiday's caliber come out and and do that and uh yeah his defense is great you know he uh he didn't have he wasn't responsible for all of uh drew or not drew all of chris paul's turnovers but he he held him down pretty well uh, i mean paul didn't score much either and it, it's it's great that drew can do that but i believe if if really needed uh chris middleton is a great defender we could put him on chris paul and and get it bring in a point guard who could do a little better uh Giannis can hold people down if needed so it's just you know, can you rationalize having Drew Holiday's defense uh, when he plays that bad offensively? Now, I don't think we would have gotten to the finals without Drew the, because he's he's popped up in some key games. The problem is, is that now that we're here, we still need him. You know, it's not like uh, we pay him just to play to the finals and then disappear. We we need his his defensive contributions and his offensive contributions to get through this series, especially when we have to win an away game to come out with the, with the championship. You know, you can't just bank on on winning all the home games because if we win all the home games we get three but you need more than three so drew's got to step it up and he he can't keep keep the mentality of well i'll just get my rhythm soon because it's, it's, it's killing us yeah i don't remember what nba players said this but like they started out missing like tons of shots and they were like you know what heck might as well keep going using so you don't lose your confidence or some crap like that and that was drew and he's just like you know what, screw it i'm just gonna keep shooting <laughs> It's like, bro, this five of his points are all free throws, which he did make all five of his free throws, um, which you kind of expect from a guard. But you only scoring eight points off of shots? I mean, that's just unacceptable, man. Like, you got to do better than that. If 
the Bucks had lost this game instead of winning, and they had lost it by, let's say, a few points, they probably would have left Drew Holiday in Milwaukee before going back to Phoenix. <laughs> and he would have woken up the next morning, get on the bus or the plane, whatever they're getting on, and they would have been gone because that would be unacceptable from a guy that, again, he's not like a perennial all-star every single year, but he has stepped up this season, and he is a huge reason, like you said, that they got to the finals in the first place because he is that number three. He is that, you know, actual big number three. You know, before they had who? Eric Bledsoe, I guess you could say, as their number three. Yeah. Or Brooke Lopez sometimes. It, it, it's not the same as a guy that's at least made an all-star game before and is a great defender. And he's generally good with rebounding and assisting. So Drew Holiday has to be better. As for P.J. Tucker. <laughs> I heard you say P.J. Tucker isn't a scorer, and we've covered multiple games over the past few episodes um, where he's, you know, scored like three points or he hasn't scored any points at all, but he's, you know, provided a great defensive presence, and they've won. This game is a little bit different because you get five fouls. I don't want to hear Milwaukee fans talking about fouls and all that because they ended up shooting – considerably more free throws than the Suns. They shot 10 more. Now, a few of those were at the end, obviously, um, you know, when they're fouling and everything at the end of the game, but you still shot 10 more. And there are definitely bogus fouls on either side. But P.J. Tucker, you get a few fouls on jump shots, and they probably weren't really fouls. You know, a lot of them were probably sold. Um, I know the foul on Jay Crowder, uh, later in the game, Jake Crowder probably sold that a lot more than what he actually got hit. Either way, P.J. Tucker has to learn, give the dude some space. Like, we've seen this type of foul be pretty prominent in the past, like, five or six years or so, right? And you think guys would learn by now to just give them a little bit of space. I understand you're trying to contest a shot. Obviously, you don't want them to make the shot if it's a three, but... If you get called for the same thing over and over, and then you turn around and look as if you don't understand that you even breath, excuse me, breathe on the dude. Like, bro, I mean, just don't do it. <laughs> I don't know how many times you have to do something, get mad at the ref. The ref look like they don't care. And you're just like, bro, you, you fouled them. And you look even more confused afterwards. You get mad, the fans are boo, and then you do it again. I, at some point, you have to learn to not do the same thing over and over. So his defense is great, like you said, and getting those five rebounds um, definitely helped. But when you had the same amount of rebounds as fouls and you got five fouls, <laughs> I'm not sure how much that really helps there. Um, P.J. Tucker's starting to look more just like an annoyance out there <laughs> instead of really contributing to the team. Uh, I mean, you can cut his fouls by two. He still committed three fouls there, and they were just just dumb. Um, regardless of whether the refs were garbage last night, which they were, uh, P.J. Tucker, you just got to be better with the fouls there. Um, now, we'll see next year when they implement the rule changes as far as these guys making all these weird motions with their bodies and stuff, trying to draw fouls. We'll see how that works out then. But... But right now, you just got to be smart, man, because the rest are going to be on the edge. You know that. Um, they're going to let certain things go because it's the finals. But you've been playing. This is your fourth round in the playoffs by now. You kind of know what's going on here. So just just stop complaining after every single foul. That's, what, that's one of the things that makes the game kind of hard to watch is the constant fouls for one. But then players, whether they get the foul or they don't get a foul, they get up and immediately complain. So I uh, just just kind of relax. Um, hopefully the NBA can deal with the ref problem. But as far as the players go, I don't need them complaining every two seconds about a missed call or a call that shouldn't have <laughs> happened in the first place. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to touch on the PJ and the foul thing, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get to the Suns as well, because I know this has pretty much been the Buck show so far. Uh, as far as PJ goes, I kind of feel bad for the, for the Suns because they had to play Pat Bev, and now they have to play Pat Bev Jr., that's what uh, P.J. Tucker is turning into because he just runs around, uh, fouls, and then and yells. And, I mean, his defense is great. Pat Bev's defense is great. Um, but he's a menace, and Pat Bev is a menace, and it looks like the same player. 
And on that same note, like you said, PJ's been through four rounds, and he had to go through, and this is not trying to be shady, but he went through James Harden in Brooklyn, Trey Young in Atlanta, and now he's got Devin Booker, who all do the, the like, you know, and, and Chris Paul, who throw themselves at defenders to draw fouls. He should be acquainted by now with the idea of leaving space so that these players can't just, you know, bump them, and then they get the foul call. But PJ, uh, being the menace and the, the Pat Bev uh, disciple that he is, it just gets right on top of people, and they all they got to do is, you know, barely tap him, and boom, they get the foul, and PJ's throwing a fit and running to the bench because he's got five fouls. And five fouls, even for a guy that's not contributing offensively, really puts the Bucks in a bad position because now, you know, Coach Bud, Bud has to wonder, well, I need to keep PJ in for the final few minutes, and he's just got this fifth foul kind of early in the fourth. I've got to sit him, and whoever I put in doesn't really have the defensive grit that PJ does, and it's more of a mental thing, because you might have someone that does play better than PJ defensively, at least as far as they're not going to foul them, but you know that PJ is an elite defender, so you're like, well, who can I put in that, that fixes this? And yeah, not only that, um, Bud has some weird substitutions sometimes. Uh, Pat did great in this game, but when Giannis sat the first time, instead of putting Bobby in to cover Giannis, he put Pat in. So he took out the 6'10 dude to put in the 6'4 guy, and I mean, you're really trying to play small ball against the Suns, and the Suns aren't exactly a huge team, but you're just essentially telling DeAndre Ayton, here you go. Uh, he didn't capitalize on that. DeAndre Ayton didn't finish very well as far as uh, scoring goes. He was great with rebounding. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much what I have to say about PJ, and as far as you go, Terrence, how do you feel about the, the Suns players' performances? Suns should have easily won this game, and Going into halftime, they were obviously tied. But then third quarter, Devin Booker was absolutely insane. Almost scores 20 points in the quarter. Uh, and at, at that point, you're thinking, all right, they're going to win. But Devin Booker was going full with fouls. Um, he fouled out, didn't foul out. I have no idea what was going on with that near the end. But <laughs> at some point, he did get five fouls. The fifth foul was probably bogus. But then what should have been his sixth foul, where he just pretty much wrapped up drew um holiday in the air i don't know what the rest were looking at and i think they said they missed it but i don't see how you can possibly miss that because drew had just shot the ball and he missed of course um Giannis got the put back that should have been his sixth foul there so i don't know maybe they're just lying and they wanted to just let it go because they screwed up before and then they had screwed up on a possession before where um they called the ball out of bounds on Devin, but it shouldn't have been. Either way, the refs were bad. Devin should have watched what he was doing because they easily could have called that, and that would have been game right there, regardless of what happened after. Um, but scoring-wise, Devin Booker was absolutely insane. Like I said, almost 20 points in the third quarter, 42 overall. Unfortunately, his teammates didn't really show up the same <laughs> way, mainly Chris Paul. Probably one of the worst games from Chris Paul in his playoff career. Um, five turnovers, which isn't like an insane amount, but for a guy like Chris Paul, you don't expect him to really turn the ball over at all. I mean, he's such a pure point guard, great ball handler, and he was just playing incredibly carelessly with the ball. Um, there are multiple times where, like you said, Drew would force a steal, or he was just tripped at one point. He just straight up tripped and lost the ball at a pivotal point in the game late in the fourth um i really don't know what's going on with chris paul i mean he hasn't played up to his standards um like we've seen him play in the past few rounds uh he might be a nursing injury again i have no idea you can't really tell anymore with chris uh, it might be like a hand or something but either way chris has to play better uh, deandre aiden he came in with 17 rebounds so that's pretty much standard for him at this point but the six points is definitely a problem there. He has to score at least double digits because uh, he is that number three. Um, Jay Crowder was your second leading scorer. You usually don't expect to see that, but he was with 15 points. And then the two cams, nine points and 10 points respectively for them. So kind of a good output there um, coming off the bench. But Chris Paul was probably the main, one of the main reasons why they lost that game. Yeah, so the Suns definitely had some issues coming in from from everyone down below Booker. I mean, Booker's foul trouble was definitely a, a hard-hitting thing. Same reason I said about P.J. 
when somebody hits five fouls, you know, a team kind of goes into scrambling mode. Uh, when Booker went out, they brought Cam Payne in, and Payne put up nine and one. Um, but Payne was just getting kind of bullied by anybody who would switch to him. And he's usually not that bad of a defender, but I mean, Chris would, would grab Payne and boom, shot to and It was just quickly became, you know, all right, we got to get Booker back in this game. Uh, and Crowder, 15 points, outscored Chris Paul, but he shot three for 10. So he got most of his points from the free throw line, which isn't, isn't bad. I mean, you, you do what you got to do, but you know, he shot three for 10, uh, Chris Paul came in and shot five for 13, which is, you know, not not like him. Chris Paul is not exactly somebody you look at as a 40-point scorer, but you could pretty much see him as an efficient scorer who's going to get get his assist and not turn the ball over. You know, five 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 turnovers from him. Mikael Bridges returned to, to uh, not being there. <laughs> Seven <laughs> points and five rebounds. Uh, five rebounds, like I said, same thing with PJ. I mean, that's great, but did that really matter as much in the end? Uh, and DeAndre Ayton, 17 rebounds. And here's the thing about those 17. He had 16 defensive rebounds. So, I mean, he was tearing up the Bucks as far as the Bucks trying to get their offensive rebounds, except he was the only one doing that, uh, really. And, um, you know, having one offensive rebound uh, on your own is just not good. So you've you got to realize, okay, well, I'm getting these defensive rebounds. It's helping the Suns stay up, helping my team stay up. Uh, when When my team misses a shot, we've got to to grab these rebounds. Now, uh, I think they missed about the same amount of shots, but you, you have some some terrible uh, brain power from the Bucks sometimes that just they just throw away what could be an easy rebound. But, uh, I mean, DeAndre, and I hate to criticize someone for having 17 rebounds, but you've got to, you know, get more offensive rebounds too. You, you can't just work on the defensive glass, or at the very least, somebody else has to help on the offensive glass. Um, Devin Booker had one offensive rebound, Jay with one, uh, Mikhail with one, Aiton with one, and Craig with one, and that was it. And so that right there is just, you know, immediately you can see where, where things went uh, compared to, you know, people in, uh, four people, three people with threes and uh, three offensive rebounds, and Giannis with, with five. So the Suns, it wasn't all about scoring. Uh, the rebounding hurt them, uh, and then just... Some some awkward turnovers, like yeah, Chris Paul at the end, he just tripped. Uh, I didn't look like Drew Drew really poked the ball out from him or anything. He literally just ran up and fell, and uh, that was that was a game sealer because that led to the to the Bucks going up, uh, I think four then, and then some other stuff happened. So yeah, DeAndre Ayton also, who's been putting up double doubles like like nothing, scored six and shot three for nine. So they just fell apart. Uh, they really almost won through a one-man army performance. I mean, that's scary for the if you're the Bucks because you have to look at this box score, look at what the Suns did, and go, how did we not win by more? And and I mean that just comes down to what we talked about with Drew and stuff. So the Suns have the same issues to look at. Chris Paul, it's weird to say this, but he's got to be better next game. Uh, Jay Crowder, uh, I mean, a 15, 8, and 3, a 15, 8, 3, 3, and 3 from from Jay Crowder is definitely not something I'd be mad at as a coach. But Aiton's got to score more, Mikhail's got to score more. And the two cams did their did their job, so you just really got to have Chris Paul step up. So they're they're really both teams are looking at the same issue. They're their number two guy, uh, I guess you'd call Chris Paul the number two at this point, uh, has got to do more. And uh, you know, I will for the Bucks is the number three guy. Chris did his 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 job last night, but you know the Suns have have the same issues. They have people that should be showing up that just disappeared. Now, will that do I expect that to happen in a home game? Not really. I think the crowd will amp them back up. I think Aiden will come back and be what we've seen. I think Chris Paul will never have a game like that again. So, but yeah, the Suns have got to be way less sloppy if they want to you know, come come through with this series win. Yeah, and just to pretty much wrap up here, uh, if you look at those shooting percentages, I mean, it was an 11-point percent difference between the Suns and the Bucks on shooting. The Suns shot over 50%. From the field, Bucks shot forty percent, almost a hundred shots, and only made about forty of those. From three, the Bucks were absolutely atrocious, twenty-four percent to the Suns thirty percent. Now they both made the same amount of threes. It's just that the Bucks took a lot more shots there, um, and obviously free throws there about the same percentage-wise. But again, the Bucks got ten more free throws. So overall. Teams got to be more aware of the officiating at this point. They know it's going to be bogus. So just you can play hard, obviously. It's the playoffs. So it's a completely different level of intensity. But 
you got to be smart with your fouls. Um, Devin Booker absolutely cannot do something stupid like that. And again, he's lucky that they missed it because if they had called the foul right there, he would have been out and it probably would have been dead just right there. So that's something you got to be aware of. Um, both teams um, need to shoot better as far as individuals and as a team uh, going forward. Suns definitely have to cut down the turnovers, 17 turnovers just to the Bucks five. That's a huge reason why they lost that game. Um, and of course, like I said, fouls, you got to be cognizant of that. But I think going forward, this series has gotten a whole lot more interesting because I was thinking the Bucks are going to lose this game. And from there, they have to win three straight, which I didn't really think was possible. Now it's just best two out of three. So at this point, anything can really happen. Yeah, I agree. I I, mean, I think if the uh, um, Bucks would have lost this this game last night, it'd be over. Um, I know uh, it's not technically over; it'd be three one. But this Bucks team is not a come back from three one kind of team. Um, but they have proven that they can come down from two zero and tie it up and take a series. Like I said earlier, this is exactly how the Brooklyn series started: uh, down two zero, come back, tie it two two. So I mean, it's possible, and and they can definitely do it now. And you you've got a real series on your hand because. Whoever wins this next game, Phoenix takes series control like very strongly because you're up three two. You just need one more, and then so you you you're up in a more interesting position as a fan to watch this because now it's there's a lot more on the line than just oh well okay it's you know it's the Suns are up two zero we'll, we'll see how things go or anything like that. So things are really interesting. Things are really tight, and we could really see either outcome come as as it yeah it's just a best of best of three now. Yep. So that's all for this video, y'all. I'd like to thank you for tuning in. Check out the podcast on Spotify and the links down below in the description. This has been T-Brown31 with J-Bot the Great. Like, comment, subscribe. We'll see y'all later.